Okay, I'll stop that there. Are we back on audio? Are you going to say anything about Babbage and Brunel? <laughs> um, <laughs> I might get something in there briefly. We can do so now. I mean, Babbage and Brunel nearly killed each other, according exactly. to Babbage's <laughs> own account. Um, although uh, it, this is uh, in a sort of semi-autobiographical piece that he wrote, on, wrote very late on in life. Um, and uh, Babbage helped out Brunel with various engineering aspects of the Great Western um, most people here, I'm sure, know that Brunel may have been a very fine engineer, but he was not a very good locomotive designer. And there was a lot of concern about the performance of the early locomotives. Babbage essentially designed the first dynamometer car. Uh, in other words, uh, a special vehicle that can measure the, the thrust and the speed and various other aspects, including orientation going around bends and so on. And um, the GWR did not run on Sundays, so Babbage was able to run experiments on Sundays. Um, and on one occasion, he tells that they pulled over into uh, a passing loop, and in the distance, he could hear an engine. Uh, and um, it turned out to be Brunel, who'd been stuck in Bristol and needed to get to the end of the line in a hurry, and had found an engine in steam and just decided to drive up the line. Um, and it was just as well that Babbage's train was in a passing loop, because otherwise they would have met each other. Head on. <laughs> Indeed. Bab Babbage quizzed him about this and asked him what he would have done. And um, Brunel said, I would have put on all steam in an effort to carry with I Presumably he was joking, you know, but the idea was that Brunel would be going faster and therefore he would in some sense win in a head-on collision. I'm not sure about that. But, uh, very dubious. So oh, uh, there, I mean, this. Babbage enjoys these anecdotes. We can't always be sure that they're, they're completely accurate. It's certainly well, that's short long, short. long after the event. So. I'm sure, sure that's true for all great men. Anyway, Adrian, we ought to start, make a start and a sure. very warm welcome to the Newcomen Society. Um, for those of you watching, Adrian Johnston is, our, is Professor of Computing at Royal Holloway College of the University of London. And a uh, particular interest, he's one of the founding committee members of the Computer Conservation Society. I know there's a very strong overlap between Newcomen Society members and the Computer Conservation Society. So we very much appreciate that uh, initiative when you were perhaps much uh, even younger. Um, he's, uh, tonight, he's going to talk about Babbage and the abstraction of mechanism uh, this no doubt reflects on his uh, Leverhulme funded work on, on uh, Babbage notation, notions and notations. Adrian, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Well, um, this is the point at which I usually say how pleased I am to be here, but in a sense I'm kind of there rather than here. I think we've got about 100 people listening in this evening. It's worth just stopping for a moment and imagining what, how Babbage would react to this notion of uh, maybe a hundred people all communicating in real time over color video and audio and all mediated through the digital computer or the analytical engine as he would have called it. Babbage was fascinated by all aspects of technology and new scientific discoveries and I think he would be so excited. He would be a lot less excited if he subsequently understood that there's essentially no direct connection between his developments and modern technology. And um, I, I, at this point, I kind of want to sort of pay tribute to the Newcomen Society, actually, because Babbage these days is a well-known name, and I think that's reflected in the strong attendance here this evening, but it was not always so. In fact, Perhaps prior to Alan Bromley's investigations in the 1980s, Babbage was an extremely marginal figure, known by very few. And one of the things that kept Babbage's uh, name alive in the century or so preceding that is this paper here, which was read to the Newcomen Society in 1933 on Charles Babbage and his difference engines, and, and really is one of the very few thoughtful uh, analyses of Babbage's work. And it's, it's well informed. Um, Babbage in his lifetime hopes that a biography, a scientific biography, would be written of his life. And he uh, left a large amount of material to Buxton Senior, the grandfather of the author here, uh, who he knew through the Royal Astronomical Society. Now, that uh, biography was never written. There is a draft of some material. And there was a trunk of papers and biographical notes that came down to L.H. Dudley Buxton 
Uh, and that's what he describes in this paper here, read to the Newcomer Society in 33. The box of papers was subsequently uh, donated to the Oxford Museum of the History of Science, and it still resides there. And you can go and access those papers. Um, well, I guess maybe if you've got the right credentials, you can go and access them. And I've had the privilege of looking at those. Now, before I get started properly, I'd like to also thank the rest of my team, um, who you see in the photograph here. Uh, we're a bit younger in that photograph than I am now. Um, that's Doran Swade on the left there, who many of you will know was the curator of computing at the Science Museum, uh, behind the uh, establishment of the Computer Conservation Society, and also the original construction of Difference Engine Number 2 many years ago now. Um, the guy in the purple top is me. Next to me is Professor Elizabeth Scott, who's my co-author on publications and put a lot of work into this project. And on the end there, you'll see Dr. Piers Plummer, an old friend of mine, um, very fine engineer. And he's the person who designed and implemented the Sting Driven Difference Engine that you saw on the video uh, before the talk started. So that's the team. And I want to acknowledge the very substantial funding that the Leverhulme Trust gave us, nearly a quarter of a million pounds, in fact. And we have support from EPSA from the college as well. And I should also acknowledge the Science Museum, the National Portrait Gallery, and the Oxford Museum of the History of Science for various uh, image releases for this evening's talk. So let's get started. I'm going to do three things in the time I have available, I hope. Um, I want to give you a biographical snapshot of Babbage so that we can contextualize his life and times and the machinery that he designed. Um, I'm also going to then talk a little bit about some mechanical details of the mechanisms. And then I'm going to turn to the notation, which Babbage viewed as his most singular achievement, but which has never really been taken up. And I'll give you some insights into why that's so. So here is uh, Babbage um, in 1850 and a slightly more heroic version of him in the oil painting in 1845. That's, uh, that's a daguerreotype on the left there, so it's not technically a photograph, but it is at least an accurate image. And um, one thing you might want to consider is what he's wearing, actually. It looks rather more uh, Jane Austen than Victorian, I think you will agree. And there's a reason for this. Uh, Babbage these days is thought of as an anachronistic Victorian engineer. But of course, he's no such thing. He's an anachronistic Georgian engineer. Um, the, uh, the key developments in different engine number one and meant much of the basic work was completed uh, substantially before Queen Victoria ascended to the throne. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that the main intellectual burst here is happening in the early 1820s. So we're in Stockton and Darlington and pre-Liverpool and Manchester territory here. You know, this is not Victorian engineering. This is something much more primitive. Here is a cartoon by Augustus de Morgan. Um, that is the de Morgan of de Morgan's theorem. For those of you that uh, remember their Boolean algebra, uh, de Morgan was a professor of mathematics at University College and a good friend of Babbage's. And um, what you're meant to take from this is that Babbage, who was after all the location professor of mathematics at Cambridge for a spell, that's the same chair that Stephen Hawking held uh, in modern times, was also a very practical man. You can see him there at his lathe building uh, devices himself. And um, I want to kind of really sort of frame the, the, the underlying research question of our project, which is this. How is it that one individual could have synthesized an entire computing design on their own with very little support, some technicians, but not very little in the way of intellectual cut and thrust, other people that he could talk to working in the same era, and do all this more than 100 years before Conrad Zutter's work in the, uh, in the 1930s. It is the most singular and extraordinary achievement. And of course, the big question that then flows from that is, well, not question, but the observation is that, um, you know, really there is no direct connection from this work to modern computing. Babbage was at best a folk hero. Nobody understood until the 1980s that Babbage's designs were practical. So I always think of Jules Verne at this point. I mean, Jules Verne wrote about flying to the moon, but nobody imagined that Verne had got a fully worked out engineering solution for a Saturn V rocket. Babbage dreamed of these computational machines and he had designs which were real and effective. And I really think we have to emphasize this because it's become very fashionable 
to treat Babbage as a, a slightly comic figure, as somebody who in some sense never finished anything. And that is most certainly not true. And it's time that that, uh, that, 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 that fib was laid to rest. Here are some timelines, which I hope will help you contextualize Babbage. So um, Babbage's own timeline, 1792 through to 1871, is represented by the purple block at the top there. Babbage had some children, I'll return to that in a moment. One of his sons, Henry Provost Babbage, um, took on some of his father's work after he retired from his main job and continued to work on the designs really right up until the beginning of the First World War. So you're kind of looking at a hundred year uh, research program here. Now it's worth saying that Henry Provost did not really progress things much beyond the work of his father, but he did attempt to disseminate the results as I'll explain later. Now the core machines, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. Uh, Jonathan, are people able to see my cursor? Yes. Moving and I've got it over the green block here. So the key machines that we need to consider are difference engine number one, and this is the, uh, this is the um, machine represented by this block here. Design starts in about 1820 or 1821, and the project ends in ignominy um, sometime later, say 1833. The analytical engine, which is the design, or rather the set of design studies for which um, Babbage is recognized as the progenitor of modern computing, the analytical engine then, is really a set of paper exercises that run from the early 1830s right up until Babbage's death and indeed beyond because Henry was thinking about these things. And then the machine that we're really going to focus on is this one here, difference engine number two. Um, Henry built a portion of the central part, the computing, what we call the central processing unit, what Babbage and indeed people with a background in ICL hardware called the mill. Um, and that's represented by this green block here. And here you can see Queen Victoria's reign and French Revolution and a few other world events to give you some context. Um, there's a shrunken version of the diagram down here, another little blip up here. And this is the construction of difference engine number two by the Science Museum um, in the uh, 1990s, no, running up to 1990. So about just over 30 years ago, the project was started. And that machine is in the Science Museum. You can go and look at it now. And there's another version of the machine in America. It was in the Computer History Museum, and it's now being taken back into ownership by the person who funded it. Here's a life in brief. Um, uh, Babbage's, um, Babbage used to be thought that he was born and brought up in Tynemouth, but um, it turns out he was actually born just at the back of the Elephant and Castle to a banker and to Betsy. Um, they did move to Tynemouth in 1808. Babbage went up to Trinity in 1810 and transferred to Peterhouse in 1812. He married Georgiana Whitmore in 1814, much of the disgust of his father, who nevertheless left him about a hundred thousand pounds when he died in 1827 and that's proper money um, as people in this audience are perfectly aware it's extremely difficult to relate modern monetary values um, because the price of labor was so very cheap and labor was what uh, Babbage actually needed so exactly how much a hundred thousand pounds translates into it translates into comfortable um, he's buried in Kensal Green Cemetery not far from the Brunels um, whom he was very friendly with uh, here are some locations in London. Um, Babbage, uh, Babbage's birthplace is down here at the back of the Elephant Castle. This is the house that he um, bought and substantially remodelled um, as a base for the developments of the computing machines. This is how it looked when it still existed. And the picture at the top here is the same site in modern times. If you look very closely, there's a little green plaque there. This is just at the back of the Marylebone High Street. While he was up at uh, Cambridge as an undergraduate, he formed a close friendship with John Herschel. That's the younger of the two famous Herschel astronomers. Um, he founded the Analytical Society to promote Leibnizian calculus. This was uh, a rather heretical thing to do because in Cambridge, Newton was revered. Um, as you may know, uh, Newton's own mathematical notation for uh, differential calculus based on fluxions is not the most perspicacious. And the Leibnizian notation, which is what we all use today, was um, common on the continent and abhorred by Cambridge. And really the function of the analytical society was to campaign for the use of continental methods. 
when you consider that we're in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars at this point, you can see that that is a rather obstreperous thing for an undergraduate to be doing. That nevertheless, they succeeded and Cambridge's, uh, Cambridge's um, uh, mathematical curriculum was suitably adjusted. As part of the tripos, uh, as part of this sort of competition between uh, colleges, they would put up their best mathematician, their best wrangler, um, in a, uh, to compete for the the honour of the institution. Uh, they had to give a they had to give a dissertation, and um, Babbage, uh, perhaps rather foolishly, decided to give a dissertation on the topic of God is a material agent. Um, what Babbage was attempting to do here was not be blasphemous but to say that even God would have, to, um, would have to acknowledge physical law and such things that we see as miraculous are in fact a manifestation of some deeper physical law. The subtlety of this point was lost on the, uh, on the Beatles and the word descendus, which basically means get off in Latin, um, rang out and he was ejected. Um, his colleagues in uh, in Peterhouse were not happy at all. Um, this is the, you know this is the equivalent of tripping over on the start line when you're a sprinter. He married uh, Georgiana in 1812, graduated in 1814. Interestingly, he didn't tell anybody he got married, even his best friend John Herschel. And John, after a while, wrote to him and said, uh, "Bandage, we hear you're married. What is going on?" And he wrote back and said, I am married and have quarreled with my father. He has no rational reason whatsoever. He has not one objection to my wife in any respect, but he hates the abstract idea of marriage and is uncommonly fond of money. And uh, I think that kind of pretty much encapsulates Babbage's view on life, which didn't stop him taking great advantage, of course, of the, of the bequest when it came. Now, Babbage is sometimes uh, painted as a rather curmudgeonly character. Um, that's simply not true. He was also something of a socialite and ran soirees to which the great and the good attended. And on one of these occasions, famously, uh, Ada Lovelace's mother took her to one of these soirees. They saw the silver lady, this automaton, and indeed uh, listened to Babbage expanding his theory of miracles, which he would demonstrate with a different engine. And um, these were big occasions and the great and the good flocked to them. So Babbage is not just a curmudgeon. On the other hand, he is clearly a difficult individual. If you have a look at the dates on this slide, I think you may get in some insight into why perhaps he became difficult. So I've entitled this slide, Et in Arcadia Ego, which is the, uh, you know, the, the, the classical notion that even in Arcadia, death lurks. So even in the garden, we find tombs and skulls. Here we have a list of um, uh, Babbage's offspring, Benjamin, Charles, Georgiana, Edward, Francis, Dougald, Henry, and Alexander. And you can see that some of those dates are really rather uncomfortable. Francis Moore, uh, 1821. 1827 is the real Annus Horribilis. In February, Benjamin, his son, dies. In July, Charles Whitmore dies. And in September, Alexander, dies, the new child, and Georgiana too, from which we infer that Georgiana died in childbirth. And it's probably worth remembering, especially at this time when we're in the middle of the COVID pandemic, that death was a constant friend in the 19th century. And we kind of sometimes imagine that the uh, emotional impact on individuals of loss on this scale was somehow diminished because, well, they kind of didn't know any better, did they? But I think that's complete nonsense. And Babbage was entirely devastated after 1827. And in fact, left his friend John Herschel in charge of the project. And Babbage in, in embarked on a world tour really as a way of, I guess, vectoring himself out of the misery of so much loss and so much unhappiness. And he did not, as far as we can tell, form new relationships after that. So um, let's just talk briefly about Henry. Um, his dates were 1824 to 1918. He uh, was the youngest of the surviving children. Uh, Charles trained him up, and Henry really took it upon himself to pursue the reputation of his father. Um, you know, there are echoes here of some of the early steam pioneers and the way their children and family continued, you know, to proselytize their reputations after their passing. Um, and Henry left us some very, very useful material, uh, particularly for my project. And this version of the mill here that you can see on the right, which is in the Science Museum now, was put together by Henry. 
Um, they made an attempt to calculate pi to some decimal places with this, and some errors did occur. The other thing that Henry did, which is rather interesting, is that he constructed these test pieces. They're all slightly different. There are six or seven of them, depending on how you count them. And he distributed them to important scientific institutions as he saw them of the day. So there's, uh, there's one in Cambridge, there's one in Oxford. One was sent to Harvard. And almost the only real link between Babbage and modern computing is uh, an anecdote where Aitken um, was in Harvard looking at Babbage's test piece. And, he, and in some sense could feel an echo down the, down the decades that here's an early computational device. But the test piece is just a simple adder. There's no program control here. This is not a computer. This is a simple calculating machine. OK, let's talk a little bit about the machines. I want to explain the uh, motivation for the construction of these devices, first of all. So um, the, um, the, the fundamental problem is how do you compute tables of logarithms, trig, any reasonable function that you want? Uh, Newton put a lot of work into this, and he developed a process called the, uh, well, they're known as uh, Newton polynomials, and there's a very cheap and easy computation process, which I'll mention in a moment. Essentially, what one is doing is fitting polynomials to the, uh, to the function that you're actually interested in. I've shown a simple example there where I've got Excel doing a cubic polynomial fit to some experimental data from one of my algorithms. And if you're a competent mathematician, you can derive one of these polynomials and it will deliver uh, an approximation to a non-polynomial function to essentially any degree of accuracy that you want, as long as that function is smooth. So you can certainly do the trig and all the other interesting scientific functions today. Um, there, Babbage kind of got interested in this in a rather indirect way. Um, they, after the French Revolution, the uh, French Republican government was rather keen on decimalization, as I'm sure you know. And they had a project to essentially uh, redefine trigonometry around a right angle with 100 degrees in it instead of 90, because that is more you know, a little bit more decimal and a little bit less Babylonian, I'm guessing. Of course, that would require recomputation of all the tables. And the French government engaged De Prony, a prominent French mathematician, to manage that process. And the algorithms that they're using are essentially Newton's algorithms. Um, it turns out that you can perform the, uh, the calculation of these polynomial tables only by performing additions. So what you can get are untrained people who can add and you give them a sequence and they start adding the numbers together. And De Prony, uh, perhaps rather charmingly and famously, employed a set of unemployed hairdressers of whom there were a plethora immediately after the French revolution because the aristocrats had either fled or were no longer in need of haircuts, shall we say. So these French hairdressers sat doing these endless editions. De Prony's work uh, is extant, it's uh, in the Bibliothèque Nationale, some of it was printed up, but not all of it, because there was a run on the French, and the French government could no longer afford to have these things printed. And in the end, the project foundered. Um, Babbage, with his connections, and he was a Francophile, a uh, difficult thing to be at the height of the Napoleonic Wars, but there we are. Uh, and he lobbied the uh, Royal Society and the UK government to put money into the French project on the basis that it would be a useful thing to have. Um, and uh, Herschel and Babbage were sitting in the <coughs> Herschel drawing room in Slough sometime around about 1820 or 1821. And as Babbage tells the anecdote, one of them, Babbage or, or Herschel, flung his hand to his head and said, by God, I wish these numbers had been computed by steam. And, and the idea of being computed by steam was kind of a metaphor for speed and accuracy in the 1820s. You know, I'm not sure how literally we should take that, but it certainly triggered something in Babbage. And he essentially went home and started sketching designs for mechanical adders so that this process of repetitive addition could be replaced by a, a mechanism. I don't have time to go through all the details here, um, but it's uh, probably suffice to tell um, the right hand set of three columns here show you the first and second derivative, uh, first, second and third derivative of a polynomial. And the thing that you're meant to notice is that the difference between these parts, if you take this one and subtract this one, you get that one. And then if you subtract that one from it, you get that one. And that works all the way across. 
And if you're familiar with uh, differential calculus, the idea that as you differentiate a polynomial, the order of the polynomial goes down by one degree until you get a constant, you can see that the differences here end up looking very similar to the derivatives. And there's a clear sense in which actually differential calculus as Newton developed it is the reductio ad absurdum, if you like, of taking differences with ever smaller differences between the two the values of x. We're just using integers here. Now it turns out that you can run this process backwards and that's what the difference engine does. So if you by hand decide what polynomial you want and compute the top four lines, in this case, if we're using a polynomial of order three, you do the red bit by hand. And after that, all you need to do is keep adding together pairs of numbers. And that's what the difference engine does. Um, there seems to have been a difference engine zero. In other words, some early prototype, which we no longer know anything about, but there are some terribly interesting pieces. So this, um, this building bottom right here is the Oxford History of Science Museum. And as part of the Buxton collection, this is the same trunk of materials that I mentioned when I was talking about the talk to the Newcomen Society in 1933. In there, there are these bits. And these bits look very like Babbage's first difference engine, but they are not parts of that engine. And what we don't know is whether these are just experiments that were discarded or whether this is actually part of difference engine zero. If you're, a, if you're of a romantic turn of mind, you imagine that this is being zero. And um, if you go to the Oxford History of Science Museum, you go up on the top floor, you will see these elements in the cabinet. I, I should stress to you that the, they're arranged like this, and this is basically just a piece of sculpture. The person that put this together in no sense was trying to recreate a working mechanism. No, this isn't how it works. Now, this is the thing that we do have, and this is difference engine number one. Um, this is the machine that the government was persuaded to put a lot of money into. And the, uh, the, the purpose of this is precisely to automate the computation of these polynomials. And this machine here can do up to polynomials of order three with a little bit of jiggery pokery. It's only a fragment, uh, about a seventh of the computing part and completely lacking the control part. Those parts were never built. Because this is the Newcomen Society, I want to mention a couple of things to you. Um, this machine, the construction of which started in 1822, predates in any sense standardization of machine threads. So uh, there are an awful lot of bolts in this machine. And if you unscrew one of them, don't run away with the idea that you can use it in a different position. Each of the bolts and nuts is hand fitted in the style of the 1820s. Now, the person who actually executed the work here is Clement, the, who is famous in the development of machine tools, as I'm sure many of you know. And um, one of Clement's journeymen who worked on this machine is Whitworth. And of course, we now know Whitworth for many things, but not least his uh, successful efforts to induce British industry to standardize threads so that you can have a box of bolts and box of nuts and guarantee that they would fit together. It's rather nice. Uh, I, I, I think it's interesting to imagine that the horror for Whitworth of constructing a machine which would have had 24,000 parts, 24,000 parts, each individually fitted um, that was enough to push Whitworth towards uh, an understanding of the need for standardization. Now, um, the Difference Engine project was not ultimately a success. The government awarded £1,700 in 1823. Mark Brunel, that's Uthenbald's father, introduced Babbage to Joseph Clement. After the Annus Marie Bliss, uh, Babbage left Herschel with £1,000 while he toured. Work ceased in 1833 and nothing more was achieved. And there was a, a, a standoff, essentially, until there was a final exchange of drawings and cash in 1844. The government spent 17,000, the Babbage spent 6,000, and the project failed. And on this rests much of the criticism of Babbage. This is kind of the first really major disastrous piece of public work, you know. I mean, the, as we know from the development of the railway system in this country, the British government had a very laissez-faire attitude towards engineering developments, unlike, say, in France, where the rail system was centrally planned. And this is an unusual uh, situation where the government did decide, decide to invest very heavily in what was essentially a private entrepreneur's project, and it failed. 
there's a lot of discussion about why it failed. Some people believe it's because it wouldn't have worked. Well, that's clearly not true because the fragment does work. The um, people that worked for Clement believed that he was essentially gold plating the work and taking a long time to do it. And that was bad with his view as well. Discuss, that's not what we're here for. Calculation complete. That's the little marker on difference engine number one that tells you that you've got to the end of a sequence. It's also the end of the machine, of course. Now, as that project was foundering, Babbage was thinking about ways to generalize this machine. So it turns out that the difference engine is essentially a sequence of adders, and Babbage began to think about what would happen if you turned it into a donut, a torus. So you fed the output from one end into the input of the other, and he started thinking about more complicated machines and became quite excited at the idea of a mechanism which could produce um, outputs that had no closed mathematical form. So this is what we would call a state machine these days. And what he was doing was designing state machines and noting that they did not correspond to well understood mathematical functions. And by a process which um, is still awaits full investigation, Babbage eventually generalized his idea to the notion of a central arithmetic unit, something like a pocket four function pocket calculator. <clears throat> with some programmable registers, uh, which uh, and under the control of a system of cards, as you can see here, taken exactly from the Jacquard loom system that was already in use for weaving, and that this general machine would enable you to execute an arbitrary arithmetic operation with operands drawn from anywhere in the store. And of course, this is exactly the uh, model of a modern computer. It's not von Neumann because the program is held on cards, but it did have a card punch. So if you're prepared to allow for the machine to punch out a piece of program and read it back in, then it certainly constitutes uh, a von Neumann machine. It is Turing complete. Um, there are interesting lacunae. It's very hard to find any reference to index addressing on this machine. But apart from that, it, it, it is an astonishing reflection of modern practice. The machine is even microcoded, perhaps much to the astonishment um, of Morris Wilkes, who spent some time investigating this design. And um, anybody who knows their computer architecture will know that Morris Wilkes invented microcoding. Um, well, Morris found to his slight cost that, um, that actually Charles Babbage had invented microcoding. It took the form of some um, barrels with studs on. And by moving the studs around, you could change the microprogram. Now, this is the machine that I really want to focus on this evening. This is difference engine number two, as constructed by the Science Museum between 1989 and 1991. Um, I've put a copy of the picture of the Rosetta Stone here on the right. And the reason for that is that this machine, which was never built in Babbage's lifetime, this is not a reconstruction. This is the first construction of Babbage's design. But um, it, it is, by some measure, the most completely documented of Babbage's designs. We have essentially the full notations. And my project is about deciphering the notation. And there's a sense in which this machine is my Rosetta Stone. Because we have the machine, which was built by the Science Museum, from the engineering diagrams, not from the notation. So we can check things out by looking on the physical machine. We also have the full set of notations. This is how the machine works, by the way. The section on the right here is the printer, which in many ways is by far the most complex version of uh, the most complex part of the machine. Um, this printer down here can do multi-column printing. You can change the font. Uh, it's not quite Excel, but it's not far off. And um, there's also the small matter of the fact that the printer is at the other end of the machine from this handle, which is the prime mover. So this machine operates with a human turning the handle, not a steam engine. Um, what happens when you get to the bottom of the tray? Well, it turns out, I don't know if you can see these weights here under my cursor, they're attached to a clapped up cord, which runs across the back of the machine. And when uh, you get to the end of the, uh, of the column, uh, a trigger here pulls out a pin over here and the handle then free wheels. And that means that the machine stops calculating when you get to the end of the tray and you then have to go and put another tray in. Um, this can print onto paper, but its real intention was to impress characters into paper mache and you could then use a uh, printer's metal to produce a metal printing plate. Babbage was very, very concerned to ensure accuracy and the number one way of ensuring accuracy was to um, make sure that the thing was untouched by human hand. 
just to give you another little anecdotal insight into Babaji's amazing focus on correctness, um, Babbage understood that his analytical engine would not have sufficient capacity to hold or be able to compute on the fly things like a table of sine theta. So the idea was that you would have a cupboard full of cards with pre-computed and punched values, sine theta for theta from, say, 0.1 degrees through to 90 degrees in 0.1 degree increments. And there was a way um, in the program of stopping and ringing the bell. And the idea was you would write on the card, would you please go and find me sine 33.3 at this point? So the machine would compute, the bell would ring, and the operator would then be given their instruction. Now, the interesting thing, and I still find it astonishing that Babbage had the foresight to do this, is that the, the cards in the cupboard not only had sine theta on them, but they had theta on them. In other words, the, the actual the number was encoded as well as sine theta. And Babbage understood that the first thing you would do after the operator had inserted this card was check they'd put the right card in. And Babbage says, uh, and if the wrong card was set, then the machine would halt once more and ring the bell louder. And this was a, 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 you know, an admonishment to the operator to get it right and do it again. So he kind of understood basic principles of error correction, even in the 1830s. This is our difference engine, which you saw running um, in, the, uh, in the early uh, part, just before I started speaking. Babbage, is, Babbage uh, conceived an engine with eight columns of 31 digits. So that could compute polynomials up to order seven. And of course, X to the seven grows very rapidly indeed, which is why you need those 31 decimal digits. Our machine is topologically equivalent to Babbage's machine, but we only have four columns, so we can do cubics. And we only have six digit wheels there. And we also opened the design up so that you can see what's going on. And we straightened the columns so that these uh, columns that I'm going to talk about in a moment are all in a line. You can see what's happening. The only other major difference between our machine and Babbage's <coughs> is that we have an independent set of cams under each column. Um, now, the reason for that is that cutting a cam accurately in Babbage's day was very expensive. So he had a single cam stack, which I can show you here. It's mounted on a vertical axle here. This is the cam stack on the right hand side. And this derives all the timing movements and they are then distributed via levers to the columns. So there's one cam controlling the odd pairs of columns and another one controlling the uh, even pairs of columns. On our machine, we simply put a new cam under each column because Firstly, we've got laser cut steel available to us. And secondly, we worried a little bit about lost motion as bearings wore um, uh, uh, on the uh, Babbage's design. Okay, um, I ought to at this point, you know, pay homage to, acknowledge he's insufficient, pay homage to Alan Bromley and indeed to my very good friend, Doran Swade, who's really responsible for all of this. Alan Bromley was an Australian academic who in the 1980s started um, seriously researching Babbage's designs and our key insights into the practicability of Babbage's designs derive from Alan Bromley's papers in IEEE Annals of the History of Computing. Um, at that time Doran was curator of computing in the Science Museum and he was a young and energetic man, he's, he's still energetic, he's not quite as young as he was, um, and he took up Alan's uh, suggestion that they try and build difference engine number two in time for the bicentenary of Babbage's birth. And they did just about achieve that. And if you want to understand more about how that was achieved, I uh, would recommend to you the Cogwheel Brain Dorans book, which is half about Babbage and half about the project to build the difference engine. Um, I'll skip that one. Doran has a nice line, actually. They need a lot of money to build that difference engine. And they built a test piece. You can see it in front of you. And he touted it around information technology companies, hoping to get some hundreds of thousands of pounds. And um, he was getting nowhere. And then they polished it and they went back again and the money flowed in. So if you are trying to get money out of uh, venture capitalists, it is important to polish things. Uh, this is our version, which uses 3D printing. Um, most of what you can see there that isn't shiny is actually laser sintered nylon. And the steam driven machine that you saw at the start is uh, steel cut cams, uh, laser cut cams, laser cut frame, and some stock gears. The rest of it is all 3D printed nylon. Okay, 
Now then, time is getting on very quickly. So I'm going to skitter through some of these slides and talk about the notation now. Um, I do have a 3D printed model of the, uh, of the atom mechanism here that I can demonstrate to you. It says time at the end, we'll come back to that. So <clears throat> what is it we're trying to do? Well, we're trying to figure out how Babbage thought, quite honestly. I mean, you look at these machines and it's astonishing that a single individual produced these designs, truly astonishing. And um, if we've learned one thing, in 50, 60, 70 years of computer science, it is that the only way that we humans, who ultimately are bears of little brain, regardless of how close to genius we might be, the only way we can manage complexity is through abstraction. And you know, modern research in computer science is all about finding notions and indeed notations, which enable us to manage the vast clerical detail. How on earth? Do you cope with a design that's got 24,000 parts in it? Well, you use the same basic techniques that we use in software. We use hierarchy, we use replication, we use controlled notations to enable us to build the abstract structures in our minds that enable us to design in this very rich space. Now let's have a little look at what was going on 40 years ago. So this is work that I was doing as a PhD student and as a young academic. Um, many of you will be familiar with the story of INMOS, the UK government's attempt to break into the semiconductor market um, via initially memories, but uh, ultimately the transputer. And it was a very important part of UK industrial strategy in the 1980s through the ALBI program. And one of the side products of that was a piece of software which did this. So these are all outputs from the INMOS um, uh, uh, Fat Freddy system, as they called it. It was commercialized by Raquel Redak and known as Integrated Systems in Silicon or ISIF, uh, which is a slightly unfortunate acronym given recent historical developments. So I shall refer to this as Fat Freddy. And what you see here is a system that is being used for symbolic design of integrated circuits. It's symbolic in the sense that you started off from a textual description, and this is a textual description of the schematic that you can see down here. This is actually a full adder, it's a CMOS full adder. And here you can see some geometry. And there's a sense in which all three of these representations are showing the same thing. This is actual geometry that you would see if you look through a microscope at that chip. This is a schematic in the form that electronic engineers are familiar with. And this is a textual version which looks closer to what you would think of as a software engineer. And the purpose of the Fat Freddy system was essentially to enable you to initiate a design in this textual form and then lay out some geometry and Fat Freddy would ensure that the geometry met this specification. And the schematic down here was basically treated as something for idiots to use. Why idiots? Well, you know, schematics are fine if you're interested in a hi-fi amplifier, which has got maybe 50 components in it. But if you're dealing with a 68,000 microprocessor, which has got 68,000 components in it, the schematic gets kind of large, you know, and um, that didn't stop people working in that way. And there are stories of people that were designing the NAT Semi 32,000 series at about the same time with floor sized printouts, like these colored diagrams I have here, crawling over the thing with really checking design rules. But this, you know, this is no way for a human to spend their time. What we need is a computer to do it. And these systems, these hardware description language systems, were the mechanism that was deployed to enable us to use the techniques of software engineering to manage large hardware systems. And I think it's fair to say now that no large digital system or even small digital system is designed in a graphical way. We use a hardware description language. The modern instances of this idea are languages like Verilog, and VHDL, and uh, Verilog is uh, syntactically quite similar to C. VHDL, rather gloriously, is essentially a derivative of the Ada language, so we have an accidental historical connection there. Now, that's 1980. This is um, 1848. This is Babbage, and what you see here is in the middle, there's something that looks a bit like an engineering diagram, although it's got these rather curious annotations on it, and it doesn't have any dimensions. Over here, you see something that looks like mathematical formulae, 
And down here, you also see something that looks like mathematical formulae. These are the basic elements. And these things down here are larger scale uh, schematic, uh, larger scale diagrams, which we call trains. And this um, sigma sign here represents what is essentially an array of objects. So it's exactly like an array in software. Over here, you've got yourself a timing diagram. So in this um, representation that we were using in Fat Freddy, once you've finished the design, you would simulate it and you would say to the computer, these are the inputs. Will you now please show me what the outputs would be? And thus you do your electronic design in, uh, in a, a mutable space because of course the cost of actually making one of these chips is immense. And you're not gonna debug this thing by throwing a design together, making one and then testing it to see whether it works. You, the money is incomprehensibly uh, out of scale. So instead you need to do it all in software. And there's a sense in which Babbage is doing that here too. So this, in my opinion, is his design medium. This is not documentation, this is a design medium. And he is designing, I mean, look, you can see all the crossings out, right? This is clearly, uh, you know, this is thoughts being funk and designs being changed in response to doing simulations. It's exactly the way that I would design a chip today, but he's doing it on paper in the 1830s and the 1840s. And you know, the more time you spend with these diagrams, the more you think if only Babbage had had a computer, he could have done this thing so much more easily. But of course he was, he did not have a computer because this is the computer coming together. This is actually part of the design notation for difference engine number two. Okay. Now the other thing that we see in modern design, especially in software, but also in hardware description languages is heavy use of hierarchy. And here I have a schematic hierarchy. This is how it's represented in software with modules. And this is a graphical layout hierarchy and there's the actual chip. Babbage is doing the same. This is a hierarchical diagram. So this is an abstraction of the trains as Babbage would call them, showing the basic building blocks and how they're connected together in the interconnections. And um, the, uh, the most interesting ones to look at are the really sadly rather few preliminary sketches we have because there you get a sense of the man's thoughts developing. It's very exciting having access to these things. So how did he actually do this? How are we doing for time? Oh, got a few minutes, we're doing okay. So, um, you know, uh, my research area is in formal languages. So my, my proper research for want of a less pejorative term is in generalized parsing and programming language semantics. And uh, that naturally leads me to be interested in formal notations of all kinds. That includes mathematical notation. And when many years ago, probably in the early 1990s, Doran Sway first told me about the notation that Babbage had used, which, he had, which no one had really done any research on, I became uh, quite excited, as you can imagine. So what is notation? And, and is it different to abbreviation? And in mathematics, notation is not the same thing as abbreviation. Notation is really about stripping meaning away and trying to make the human think in a very mechanical form. In other words, don't, don't try and imagine what this thing does, just actually follow the rules. As Bertrand Russell said in 1931, ordinary language is totally unsuited for expressing what physics really asserts. Since the words of everyday life are not sufficiently abstract, only mathematics and mathematical logic can say as little as the physicist means to say. And that's a very insightful comment, I think. Um, of course, some people get very excited about notions and notations. And there's a famous uh, anecdote of Gauss um, uh, speaking to another mathematician who said, well, we can't possibly uh, we can't possibly investigate this phenomenon because we don't have the right notation. And Gauss famously said, uh, in our opinion, truths of this kind should be drawn from notions rather than notations and solve the problem on the spot in his head. So there you go, two alternate views. This is Babbage himself writing in 1821. 1821, I mean, this is still a very young man and it's before he's built all these machines. And, um, you know, before there are, there's much in the way of railway system out there either. I've always considered notation as the grammar of symbolic language which can have its fault to concord barbarisms and bad style. And that's for sure. You, you can write nonsense in any programming language you want, you know, and there's no way of avoiding that. Much later on in life, um, towards the end of his life, he said this, and this is really important because Babbage viewed the notation as his 
primal achievement. And I think he's right because the machines are fantastic, but the notation is the idea by which the machines were designed. So in that sense, it's the meta thing, not the thing. And meta things are always more interesting than things. He said, by the aid of the mechanical notation, the analytical engine became a reality for it became susceptible of demonstration. And what he means is he wasn't able to handle all the complexity in his head, but the notation enabled him to think about the complexity and reason about the years. Now, this point was completely lost on the engineering establishment and continued to be so, frankly, in my opinion, until the 1980s, because, it, you know, Babbage was dealing with things that had a state space well beyond any equivalent machine. If somebody shows you an engineering diagram of a steam engine or even an internal combustion engine, it's not hard to understand what's going on because basically things just going round and round. It's only when you introduce memory into a system so that state is in some sense captured in an inanimate part of the system that's just sitting there most of the time not doing anything. That's when life gets very hard because you as a human in some sense have to keep track of that state. And um, the degree to which this point was lost on people is not surprising because such systems did not exist until probably Zeusa in the uh, 1930s. And then you see this thing materializing in software. But even then, the hardware folks really stuck to their pretty drawings right through until the 1980s and 1990s in some cases. And here's an interesting case. This is um, Rouleau. You, you may know Rouleau. This audience, I'm sure, is familiar with the history of mathematics. Um, Rouleau is the individual whose two main claims to fame are a proper algebra of linkages. Um, so you sometimes see these rather beautiful sets of linkages that are instances of all the linkages that there can be in the plane. And Rouleau, uh, and this book, in fact, Kinematics and Machinery, is the book that established the correctness of that algebra. The other thing that Rouleau did um, was essentially invent, invent the 50 pence piece. Um, you'll remember uh, that the 50 pence piece has a constant diameter. You can use them as rollers, even though they actually look like they might be polygonal. Uh, and that's a, that they're called Rillard, Rillo polygons. And um, I don't know if you can see it on your screens, but I've got a, 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 a Rillo triangle rotating here. Um, this is the same kind of thing that you use for drilling square holes if you're, a, if you're an engineer. Now, what did Rillo say? Well, Rillo said this, he he's one of the very few people to have commented on Babbage's notations, essentially the only one that I know of. And he said that it is at once evident that under this system, mechanisms of completely different construction might be represented by one and the same set of symbols. And this is a criticism. And this is diametrically opposed to the position that any modern computer scientist would take, because what Rouleau is describing here is abstraction. The whole point is that you can design in an abstract way and then you can instantiate a variety of different physical systems, each of which meet that specification. But of course, you know, in the uh, 1870s when Rollo was writing, the idea of there being a computer architecture with multiple instantiations of the architecture was, was you know, he wouldn't have thought of that. But it certainly makes a very poignant uh, observation now. So time's getting a bit tight. I want to show you a few examples um, and uh, then we'll have to draw to a close. The early uh, notation that Babbage developed in the 1820s was linear, and he used it mostly to think about gear ratios and clocks. And here are some examples. And um, here you can see some of the symbols that Babbage designed. So he had all kinds of different dotted and curly lines, which represented different kinds of mechanical interaction. So um, you might have an intermittent gear or uh, you might have a rod that pushed another rod, or you might have um, a, a, a one of Rouleau's linkages, and they would all be represented by different shaped interactions on the diagram. Um, that was insufficient. Uh, it doesn't cope with feedback, and in due course, Babbage developed a much more sophisticated notation, which is what you can see represented here. This is part of the notation for the printer on DE2. And the basic idea is that every part has a set of what he called action points, which might in fact be planes. Um, and these interactions are associated with the objects. So let me see if I can skip ahead. So this is the full description of the printer. And you can see it looks very like a flow diagram. And that diagram is capturing the chain of causal effects in the printer. Um, 
the sharp end of an arrow is basically an object that's getting bashed and the blunt end of an, an arrow is an object that is doing some bashing. And because of course uh, gears can be intermittent, there can be double-ended arrows as well. These are the timing diagrams that he would draw. And this is part of the timing from difference engine number two. And I view this as him checking the effectiveness of the design by manually uh, uh, simulating it. I don't actually know that that's what he did. It's possible that he wrote these diagrams first and then designed a mechanism for them. But I think this is a simulation, not a primary design. This is how the notation works. Every object and every action point is given a letter and can have up to six indices around it. These ones at the top here are my favorites. These are little icons that are meant to be, give you some mnemonic value to remind you what the part might be. And here is a, a reasonably complete set of these icons. So for instance, the closed dot there is an axle. And um, here and there, there are some things which are really very suggestive. Let me just go back a slide. So here are the ones I like particularly. This one here is a clock escapement. This is a pendulum, solid axle, hollow sleeve axle. And then there are icons to represent the kind of motion that is being executed. Um, reciprocating means going backwards and forwards from above. So that means going backwards and forwards on the X axis or the Y axis. Curvy linear, as far as I can see, just means yeah, everything else. One of the things that you realize with Babaji's design process is that the machines are kind of constrained to be brutally rectilinear. He tends to be doing thing in, things in either the X, Y or the Z axis. And um, it would have been very interesting. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, mechanisms that are used to control the brakes or the gears on a bicycle. They were invented by somebody that was working with Rally in the 1890s. And those mechanical systems, which comprise an uncompressible wire going through a tube, um, were exactly what Babbage needed, but unfortunately he didn't have them because they are a way of transmitting linear mechanical motion via something that looks suspiciously like a wire and you can run it at any angle and you run it in a loop if you want and he would have been able to wire his machines rather than having to work so hard to get everything into three dimensions. But, you know, that's a trick that was missed. This is a complete set of the uh, icons that Babbage distributed around about the time of the Great Exhibition in 1851. And um, you, you, can, uh, you can read up some of these things. I'm gonna draw to a close now because I'm aware of the fact that we're absolutely up against time. And I want to uh, have a little bit of an opportunity for discussion. Um, and uh, I'll leave you for now with the picture here of our 3D printed version of that diagram there. So, Jonathan, am I right in thinking I should shut up at this point? Yes, that gives us about three or four minutes. And you've done a superb job of uh, showing us how you can uh, manage complexity through abstraction. And I'll immediately go away and read up uh, uh, hardware description languages. Um, have we got it? Um, have, have we, well, I'm just looking to see whether the flags have come up for the questions. Um, no, okay. Um, can we uh, just... Uh, uh... I have another quiver, I have another arrow in my quiver, Jonathan, if you'd like me to just to fill the last few minutes. <laughs> no, what I, I want to say that. is I want to get you to speculate. I ah. mean, all, all modern chips are clocked. Yeah. Clockless chips uh, came and went. Uh, Babbage presumably would have been entirely happy with that concept, running by the clock. Yes, his machines are synchronous, um, and uh, the uh, you know it, Babbage um, Babbage had a few pet hates. So he hated springs, for instance. And um, if you understand the uh, the the quality of spring steel in the eighteen twenties, you can imagine why that might be. So uh, to give you an example of how very very synchronous he wanted his machines to be, um, the uh, those cam stacks that I showed you, both in our machine and on Babbage's designs. They're dual cams. So, you know, on a modern cam, you would have a spring loaded cam follower. So essentially the cam is pushing the cam follower and then a spring gives you the return. But Babbage didn't trust springs. Um, they weren't reliable rate and they broke. So instead he specified that there would be two cams and where one was pushing, the other one would be pulling. And there would be a fixed yoke. 
so the machine is always uh, locked together and there, there's no there's no sloppiness in the machine at all um talking uh, i've got friends down at west Dean college in the clock restoration area and um uh, you may know the Bose Museum um, uh, Fisher, and that was restored for an exhibition at the Science Museum a few years ago. And I've heard indirectly from the person who did the restoration that the the that that too has the, that cam arrangement, and they're actually known as Babbage cams in neurological circles, which is um uh, it's a uh, it's a little bit anachronistic because the, the the that that automaton is significantly older than Babbage. Three dates, Babbage. Yeah. So. But nevertheless, this idea of uh, a system which is so brutally deterministic and clocked that it's actually, you know, could, could in principle almost be run backwards, actually. Now, that's not completely true. Um, and there are springs in DE2 because the columns with the 32 digits on are very heavy. And there are springs which are essentially being used to damp the motion. Um, and they're right at the top as well. So if they break, you can unbolt the top and put a new spring in you don't have to dismantle the whole machine and we're running very close to time but what, perhaps one last question which appeals to me too having written on interrupts philip ingram asks were there any notion of interrupts or overflows or uh, certainly overflow in fact the control flow mechanism in the analytical engine is essentially overflow it's a process known as running up by babbage mm -hmm and it's deliberately uh, inducing overflow and there's a carry bit pops out the top as well. So, um, but you know, I said the analytical engine doesn't really exist and it doesn't. What there is is a large set of design exercises that kind of come in three phases, you know, so you can't talk about the analytical engine in the same way that you can talk about the difference engine. And um, the, uh, one of the things that Babbage never seems to have really got into is macro level uh, control flow. So he was, he became, as many people, including me, have, he became rather obsessed with microprogramming, think his divider and various other functional units and shaving very small amounts of time off of the cycle time of these things by moving stunts around on the barrel. And I think we have to be very careful about back projecting our understanding onto Babbage. I, I believe that Babbage really thought of the cards not so much as the external program, but as a kind of macro on the barrels. And I think in his head, did, yep. he thought barrel programming was what you were doing. And the cards were a way of, in a sense, calling up a sure. subroutine that was on the barrels. Yep. Um, I, I don't have much evidence for that. But it would explain why the, the control flow mechanism, looping and so on, is so poorly developed. You know? and, and also, he just got architect's disease. You know? He became obsessed <laughs> with optimizing functional units rather than thinking about the full scale architecture. He knew that he could knock that out when he needed to. Well, Adrian, I don't know whether we're about to be cut off, but just in case we are, just in case we are, uh, a very warm thanks for a most excellent okay. paper. I thought that was wonderful and I'm looking forward to seeing the recording through so that I can pick up the finer points. But in case we're not being cut off, <laughs> I have a yeah. host of questions that are now flashing up on the screen. If you've got a oh, okay. moment more, is that okay? Yes, certainly. I mean, uh, one, are you, you going to feed them to me? I can yeah, see the sure. chat. But, and yeah. one, one obvious question. Can we carry on, John? We're, we're all right. No problems at all. Yep, we're, we're unlimited on time, so you can carry on Excellent. as long as you like. <laughs> so I've done the finish for the film. <laughs> Um, there's one obvious question that's come up from Paul Wernick. Um, uh, any link or influence between, uh, between Babbage and Turing's notion of the machine? Is there any idea that Turing had, had, uh, had any concept of, of, of Babbage's machine when he came up with the famous paper on universal machines? I, I, I think not for several reasons. I mean, so, you know, in, in my day job, I sort of lean towards theoretical computer science. But my, my views on Turing's work are informed more by his mathematical background, and I'm probably wrong. But it's uh, Turing certainly knew about Babbage and indeed the, uh, the Ada Lovelace paper. Um, and it in fact refers to it in one of his later, more discursive papers. And he knew of other efforts as well. So um, there was a, a team, a father and son team in Scandinavia, the Scheutzes, who read about Babbage's machine and became quite excited and developed their own machine. Um, and um, 
Babbage's friends were a little nervous about this because Babbage was known to uh, express himself rather clearly on occasion. But Babbage was, no Babbage was nothing if not true to himself. And even though he'd had this sort of disastrous experience with the UK government and he'd been humiliated in the press, he'd offered them the design of difference engine number two, which is a fantastically elegant system. It only has a third of the parts of the D1 and it's a very beautiful machine. And the government was very much um, once bitten twice shy and didn't want that design. So all of these humiliations and failings. But when the Schertz brothers, uh, the Schertz father and son team turned up with a working difference engine, Babbage went into overdrive, proselytizing on their behalf and saying, no, look, you know, we really need this, even though it's not my design. Um, Babbage said of the Schultz machine that um, addition has been done very many times, but it's the carry mechanism that is the interesting part of all of these machines. And the Schultz system, which kind of works a little bit like railway sidings, it's very interesting. Babbage was really rather taken with this. And Henry Provost Babbage um, wrote a nice paper where he applied the notation to the Schultz machine. It's, as far as we know, it's the only time the uh, notation was used for anything that didn't emerge from Babbage's own mind. So um, coming back to Turing then, Turing's work is actually about computability, not computers, and they're not quite the same thing. Yeah, Turing, Turing is uh, attacking the Hilbertian problem of deciding whether, you know, in the end, we can get all the axioms out of mathematics. And to do that, you need to have a clear understanding of what computation actually is. So the 18, uh, the 1930, uh, what is it, 1934, 35, and Scheidung's problem paper is part of that milieu in which Gödel is producing Gödel's incompleteness theorem. You've got post systems. It's all about, it's not about practical computation. It's about defining what it is that we mean by an algorithm and a process. And, you know, Turing is trying to find the simplest formal representation of computation, which is a very, very long way away from a practical computer. And you, you will note that ACE doesn't have much to do with Turing machines. I mean, ACE does not look like a Turing machine. And, um, you know, and, and um, so, no, I, I, think, I think the connection is quite minimal. And I think that's, from the point of view of the Newcomen Society, and, you know, I'm being a little philosophical for a moment, I think one of the reasons why Babbage is so important is because it's a, one of the very few contributions to the history of failed ideas. I mean, almost by definition, failed ideas disappear, um, you know, and we lose them. And that means we don't know how many times things have been invented. We only know about the ones that stuck. And this is a fascinating episode in intellectual history because we do have a fully worked out system, nearly fully worked out analytical engine. All the stuff is there, you know, and, and it triggers these extraordinary you know, steampunk ideas about what would life be like yes. if functioning computers were available in the 1840s. And we don't know, of course, but it would look a bit different now. And yet, and yet, there isn't actually any lineage because it's a failed idea. Um, there's no evidence, really, that Eckert and Morkley or Zeusser had any real understanding of what Babbage was doing. There's certainly no there's no obvious appearance of Babbage's ideas in their work. And it's only really until Maurice Wilkes is looking at the papers and Alan Bromley is looking at the paper in, in the 1980s that we really started to understand that this wasn't just a castle in the sky. It could have actually worked. So multiple independent invention, as, as we know, does often happen. But this is, yes. as you say, one of the yeah. best documented ever. Yeah, I mean, and, also, and, I should add that for those who saw the introductory film, you're no mean contributor to steampunk yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it's true. Um, uh, although I, I, I must give credit to Piers. I mean, um, I, I asked Piers to design uh, CAD models for a simulation that we were going to do. And he went away and designed that small test piece that I've shown you. And, and this is a retired engineer. I, I've got a tip, by the way, if there are any young academics in the audience, um, if you're employing postdocs, what you need are retired guys. Because um, as, as all young academics know, when they get their first research grant, they need to find a postdoc. And of course, a postdoc is far more interested in pursuing their own career goals than sure. they're being asked to do. Yeah. You, get, you get people that are retired, they'll they'll pick the ball up and run with it. And um, it's Piers that designed that machine and he built the 
steam engine um, and uh, the uh, SME, which many of you will know, the Society of Mechanical and Experimental Engineers, uh, uh, awarded Piers a prize for that work um, last year. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we've presented and indeed run the steam engine in SME. And as you can imagine, they, they, uh, they, they rather like it. So we'd love a live demonstration uh, when mm -hmm. everything returns to normal. Can uh, I pick that, up on another line of a li another line of questioning before you disagree with that? <laughs> um, one of the issues about the early tables was that they contained errors. They sometimes contained deliberate errors, mm -hmm. uh, as do ordnance survey maps, of course, to spot breach of copyright. Uh, someone's asking, Peter Turve is asking, uh, apparently the drawings for the difference engine number two contain rotation errors. Uh, was, was that deliberate or, or, or did it turn up in his notation? What's the story behind that? Well, I've, I've, I've talked to uh, Doran Swade about this quite a lot. Um, and uh, everybody involved with the construction of DE2 basically agrees that it's a drafting error um, oh, because nice. it's too non-subtle. I mean, there are many, many places where you could change a number and change an angle and make something not quite right. And the uh, what if I um, if you could just bear with me for a moment, I'll switch cameras and try and demonstrate uh, what I'm speaking about to you. I'm not sure if there's enough light. Can you uh, can you yeah, see? Sure, that's uh, fine. Yeah, that's okay. your so, overhead camera. Yep. Yeah. So this is a 3D model, a 3D printed demonstrator. We've developed this for use with um, museums. So the Oxford History of Science Museum uh, is going to be running sessions with this. It's a hands on activity. And of course, in the time of COVID, it's all frozen now. But this essentially is the core addition mechanism uh, from difference engine number two. And if you look at it, you'll notice that the green and the red numbered wheels, the numbers are going in different directions. So they're different yes. handedness. And that's because we're transmitting information via the sector wheel. So both the green and the red wheels are going to be going in the same direction because of the usual gearing parity. And uh, because we're doing subtraction as we go across here, we need the numbers to go in different directions. So the whole, um, the whole difference engine number two comprises, um, I'll just flip the camera back again. Excuse me a moment. So difference engine number two is a modular design and you can implement uh, uh, tabulation of polynomials to any degree that you wish and if you're you know if you want to do a polynomial of order k then you need k plus one columns and the columns come in these odd even odd even pairs and as a result um, the carry mechanism in particular comes in a left-handed and a right-handed form and and quite a lot of the machine is in this left right form and the the error that indeed is on the diagrams is basically a handedness error and it's an obvious handedness error as soon as you start you know if you started writing building a cad model of this thing yeah which was done of course then it's obvious so so i think it's just a mistake actually um i think the thing that's really extraordinary is that it's the first approximation is the only mistake um i mean this thing was never built and babbage designed all this in his head use the notation very extensively as I've demonstrated and then the drawings were made by his drawing staff and the science museum constructed the machine from these undimensioned drawings that you've seen they Babbage somewhere writes in his uh, memoirs that the machine was this many feet long it's about the only it's the only thing we know about the size of the machine and everything was scaled back off of that and um, and it worked astonishingly it works uh, so how it's, much it's, was interpolation and, and how much was the babbage design for a, a difference engine two for instance oh it's it's all the babbage design it's all there there's they there there are there are some setup issues um there is a little bit of fettling that's required here and there as yes, there is with word. all mechanical systems no but the design is complete this is why i i get i get um i get distressed when i hear babbage described in rather disparaging terms as the man who never finished anything. It's simply not true. The Difference Engine mm. 2 design was finished and Doran and his crew built it in 1989 and it works. And, mm. uh, and that's that, you know, and there are, uh, you know, and it's clear that Difference Engine number one works as well. I mean, it has been used. Uh, it does operate correctly. So, um, you know, it, we seem to enjoy knocking people down, don't we? Um, but, uh, 
to me, Babbage is, is uh, I, I, sit, I mean, I, I am, I have been a hardware person. I do much more theoretical things these days, but I did design that chip and I've designed several computer architectures. And the idea that Babbage could have achieved all this and it works, uh, I find that astonishing, the level of discipline that he was um, able to bring to bear on these problems. And at the danger of trespassing on your time, I mean, can I ask a question? Of course, Jonathan. The whole story so far is essentially uh, digital. Um, yeah. Was there any, um, how should we say, playing with analog? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it is digital, and one has to keep saying that because... Um, one of, one of the interesting things about Babbage, and in particular Ada, is it's become an industry now. And there is a lot of, um, I'm not quite sure what the polite form for it is, but it's what Americans call BS, I think, in this arena. And I have several times seen people refer to Babbage's machines as analog because they have things that go round. Now, this is a stupid and foolish thing to say because, you know, that, that's because people that don't understand these things uh, think that a watch with hands is an analog device and a digital one is a digital one. One of the things that I find most extraordinary, I mean, this, this is the thing, if this doesn't make you go, wow, then, you know, I, I don't know what else. Let me show you something else, because every time I do this, it blows me away. I want to show you uh, up close one of these wheels. So I'm lifting this up. I want you to notice that the gear wheels have a flat on them. And you see that they, they don't come yeah. to a point all around yes, it, they've exactly. got a flat. And on his now, drawings too. Yeah, it's all there on the drawing. Now, um, I haven't published this, so please don't go and write a paper about this to any of the people that are listening, but I want to tell you about something amazing. Babbage was very worried about errors and he obviously did everything he could to ensure that the machine was deterministic. I've already talked about the Babbage cams leading to rigidity in a part of the machine that might be driven backwards in the wrong way. Um, but he also, as far as I can see, understood about metastable states. Now, those of you that are digital engineers will know that in electronic digital systems, in any real system, there is a finite probability that a, a flip-flop will become balanced where instead of the two sides being at one and zero, they're both yep. at a half. And there is nothing you can do to um, uh, eliminate this risk, but what you can do is reduce its probability by having very high gain in the electronics. Sure. And that's how yeah. metastabling is handled these days. But there's always a risk of error. And after all, that's why we have error correcting codes and all that good stuff. Now, Babbage understood that frictional losses in this machine that we're looking at, so just, you know, backlash and wibble wobble, might lead to a situation where the gear, now I put a ratchet on this one, the real machine doesn't have ratchets on it, but I want you to imagine that it's stuck. It's kind of, the, the error is about half a digit. And because it's about half a digit, we can't tell whether it should be five or three five or four and Babbage allowed for this with these flats now when the machine is in operation at the end of each sub cycle a big knife it's actually a sort of six foot long big chunk of steel with a beveled edge on it comes in and it ensures that all of the gear teeth are normalized so you can view this as essentially the digitization mechanism so this ratchet doesn't exist the thing runs around and then these knives come in and grab the machine. You actually saw a similar mechanism on our machine, but they're vertical and they go up and down. And the idea is that these knives, if the machine is in an indeterminate state, the knives will be blocked on that flat. And as a result, the machine jams. And this is deliberate. Babbage referred to it as derangement. And if the machine became deranged, you had to stop and go back to the start point and set everything up again and run it again. So what we're seeing here is Babbage with extraordinary foresight in the 1840s, understanding that errors will occur and we need hardware mechanisms to detect these errors. And we don't have error correction here, but we do have an error detection mechanism and it's a mechanical, physical locking mechanism. And how on earth he understood that? Well, I suspect that difference engine number one had this problem because difference engine number one has lobes around the gears and 
the uh, there are things that effectively look like spring loaded cam followers which and and they ride on these lobes and that causes the uh, the wheels to only be able to rest in one of the digitized positions but the lobes are hemi uh, are uh, are semicircles and so it's always going to go into one or other state and if you had a lot of lost motion then you might lose a digit or it might flip over into another digit uh, because it's a continuous it's a continuous circle with a cam follower on it and it is going to go one way or t'other. So I strongly suspect that this idea of introducing the flats in difference engine number two derived from observed failures of difference engine number one. And I think that also explains why the thing is so damn large because when you look at Babbage's designs, the early wheels are about that size. And in fact, the late ones are about that size too. And the ones in this era, which is the mid-era hardware, are huge. And I think it's because the ratio of the flat to the gear um, uh, rotation angle, which is nine degrees, that's essentially the noise immunity of this system. So, you know, in electronics, we set the voltage levels yep. close to the rails and there's a zone yep. in the middle, which is the noise immunity zone. And that enables uh, logic zero to get a noise spike on it and not actually trespass into the logic one region and that noise immunity is critical in all modern electronic systems and i believe this is mechanical noise immunity and every time i look at that i almost well up you know how on earth somebody in the 1840s can have understood that potential problem and have engineered a working solution uh, i find it actually incredible Sometimes I look at this stuff and I think it's all a hoax, <laughs> you know, that somebody kind of like reverse it. I don't know if you're familiar with the science fiction story, um, Noise Level, which uh, is about a bunch of scientists who are locked up in a room and told that somebody's invented anti-gravity. And of course they haven't, but the scientists are so fired up by this that they uh, go and invent anti-gravity. Uh, it's just a science fiction story. Yes. But I do sometimes look at Babbage's stuff and say that if they think if the author of of, um, of that short story had known about Babbage, he would have used computing as his as his substrate, not anti-gravity, because it, it just seems impossible. It's so anachronistic. But that makes the point too, that he wasn't a mechanical engineer, because if he'd have been a mechanical engineer, presumably he would have worried about lubrication and friction. Yes, there's not much load in these systems. Um, one of the things about difference engine number two is that all of the communication is local. So one column oh, is right. driving another one. Yep. There are issues in the analytical engine, and he does reason about those, um, because um, when you're talking about long distance communication in mechanical systems, you have to start thinking about coefficients of thermal expansion and so on, um, because there is only a nine degree difference between two digits on those wheels. And if you're driving a rod uh, 10 or 15 meters long, then you don't need much expansion to move the thing by nine degrees. and um, in my view, those issues were not sufficiently understood or worked out by Babbage. And as a result, the, the paper designs that he has um, would have needed air conditioning. Mm. I mean, moving on, he, 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 he clearly thought in terms of integers and, 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 uh, and, and decimals. Any I'd say fixed of, point rather than floating point. Yeah, yeah I mean the, these machines are we, are integer root. Yes, but mm. he 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 had a very well worked out system for fixed point, uh, and he understood all that. And um, the uh, that's that after all is why the columns are so high on these machines because he was interested in high degrees of accuracy. But he understood that they were finite. I mean Babbage. Babbage was heavily involved with the development of early ideas around modern algebra with Peacock um, at Cambridge and was certainly um, fully familiar with the continuum and all the aspects of calculus as were understood well, by him. Yes, because you said he was had, had the rad radical Leibniz view of calculus, which... Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, he, he, um, he wrote extensively on, uh, on the calculus of functions and he did, he did some significant, he did some medium significant scientific work, um, uh, mathematical work. So there is, there is a body of mathematical papers. There's a book by Dubby, which explores the significance of Babbage's mathematical work. It's not groundbreaking but it's there and certainly he he had all of the intellectual tools available to him but of course the first thing he would have understood is the finiteness of the representation in these machines and if the if the representation is finite i mean 
let's face it, when you're doing floating point, you're not really. You're just you're just messing around with long integers and you're deciding <laughs> that's what it means. You know, I mean, there are just bits at the bottom. I mean, another interesting question, though, is why he chose decimal and not binary. Um, that's exactly was going to be my follow up question. <laughs> I was going to ask the dumb question. Did he well, know of binary and did he ever refer yeah. to it? Yes. Um, and uh, he, uh, he 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 also, for instance, explored using rods that were being pushed so that the information was represented as rods that were in or out rather than rotation. Um, yes, he fully understood all of that. Um, as far as I can tell, his uh, his uh, reasoning was simply that he wanted human operators to be able to read the numbers off directly from the columns. And this actually leads to significant difficulty with the analytical engine because um, he developed a system of what we would call sign magnitude uh, notation now. So, of course, we would use two's complement or ten's complement, but a human trying to read a negative number off in ten's complement is not attractive. So instead, he designed the machines to always show the mantissa and to have a, a, a sign bit at the top, essentially. And as anybody who's a hardware, a digital hardware designer will understand, developing algorithms for doing arithmetic in the presence of sign magnitude is very significantly messier than using uh, twos or, uh, as it would be in this case, tens complement notation. Um, and that clearly was an active choice. And for a long time, uh, when, when I was young and naive, I assumed that Babbage just didn't, um, didn't know about two's complement. That's not true. He knew all about it and he discusses it. Yeah. So, uh, so it's one, basically the user interface. Uh, uh, um, one um, odd question, if I may, perhaps the last one. Hardware design languages of the sort that you've been talking about that evolved, for instance, from your after your time of, of the 1980s, they are essentially programs. I mean, they've got a time sequence in them, but they're essentially programs. And that leads us on. OK, I'm, I'm arguing with the wrong person. Oh, yeah. no, that, that, that one component of it is a program. I mean, yeah, sure. They're but fascinated. I mean, you know, usually they have they have a facet which describes geometry, a facet that describes, say, register transfer level representation, where everything is represented as a bunch of T-type flip-flops and some combinatorial logic. And then they'll have a representation which really does look like a program, and that's usually referred to as the behavioral specification. And most of the work that's been going on in the last 40 years, and I haven't been in that field, so I apologize to anybody in the audience that knows more about this than I do, but most of the work has been uh, essentially what can we do to take a behavioral description, which is very close to a program and get it to generate optimized hardware back of that. So what the hardware folks call synthesis, which is the analog of software compilation. You know what I mean? When I started as a young academic, I was teaching machine code and assembly language to first and second year undergraduates and our students to first approximation see no machine level representations of anything anymore. We yeah. throw them a little tidbit in the first year, but you know, no modern programmer is thinking about um, machine level things. They're thinking about the semantics of Java, really, or, sure. you know, an interpreted language. Uh, and if you're lucky, they'll understand how pointers work in C. But um, when, when you think about, you know, what it's like to directly program a machine with, um, with exposed timing, so a heavily pipelined machine um you really don't want the humans anywhere near that they always get it wrong um, <laughs> what i'm getting at is what's the link then between what we now regard as programming and babbage's notation i mean to what yeah. extent would you call it a a, a, pro a program he clearly has all the elements there but would you actually call it a program well this is a good question and it, it kind of it touches on the point I made earlier about Babbage spending a lot of time thinking about microcoding and exactly how he thought about the macro level, if you like, mm. program, yeah, sure, what we think of as the assembly language instructions, because he never kind of got to that. And he, he felt no impetus to drive in that direction. He knew he could do it and he just stopped thinking about it. So what's, what's really going on? And I am. Um, He's, he uses the word notations for things that these days people call the programs. So there is, this, there are a set of programs for the analytical engine. 
they're nearly all trivial examples. The only one that's substantive is the computation of the Bernoulli numbers, which is the example that's developed in the, um, in the uh, expanded version of Menabrea's paper. So uh, as many people here will know, Babbage gave a talk in um, Italy uh, on the analytical engine, and it's one of the few places where he really discussed much of the technical content. Um, and an individual called Menabrea, who went on to become yeah. prime minister of Italy, though I believe that's uh, you know not as rare an event as you might imagine, um, he wrote a paper in French, and um, uh, Babbage's friends were anxious to use this paper, which was a good one, to proselytise on behalf of Babbage's work. And uh, they cast around for somebody who might do the translation work and um, various uh, people in the scientific community then suggested young Ada Lovelace who did, do, who did perform the translation. And Babbage and Ada worked together quite intensively for a period of about nine months on that paper. The, the final paper is very substantially longer than Menabrea's paper. Um, these are the so-called notes that Ada added. And, um, I very carefully don't talk about Ada very much in these talks because she has become a political football. Uh, and yes. I have encountered people who've uh, almost shouted at me, quite honestly, suggesting that in some sense Babbage stole Ada's ideas. There's some very, very curious, uh, uh, curious narratives around there. What, what is clear is that Ada was a very bright young woman who had been trained up by Augustus de Morgan essentially to the level of an undergraduate mathematician, probably had research potential, but wasn't able to exercise that due to the culture of the time and the fact that she died early. And um, they worked intensively and quite angrily on occasion with each other. They both had difficulty communicating. My colleague, Elizabeth Scott, who you saw on one of the earlier slides, um, uh, feels some, uh, some affinity with this because the two of us argue rather a lot about things as well um, and it's in the nature of scientific collaboration and I think one ought to look at that paper as a collaborative exercise. Now what constitutes a program? Well people often say that Ada was the first programmer that's just clearly nonsense you know I mean you don't sort of accidentally design a computer and then Ada comes along and says oh look you've designed something that I could write a program for it's obviously crazy but perhaps more pertinently the material in the paper is not itself a program. It's what we would call a program trace these days. It's not a set of instructions with loops. It's essentially an enumeration of the states that the analytical engine would proceed through during the elaboration of one run of the programs. So it's a trace, not a program. And, and then the question is, well, where are the programs? And they're kind of not there. And they're not there because the macro architecture is essentially ill-defined. And, and there are obvious things that are missing. So um, it's hard to see any evidence for indexed addressing, for instance, and that means that arrays are difficult. And, and yet and yet, it's pretty clear they would have been there because you actually need arrays and indexed addressing to do the Bernoulli program properly. And this point is kind of gracefully elided in the famous Menabrea Ada Lovelace paper, but it is clear, you can tell from the fudging that's going on that they know that there's something missing there. So the analytical engine as we see it from the diagrams has no direct connection from the data path to the control path. So you can't easily say, you can't compute an address and say, go and get me this variable. And yet, you know, we know that you need to do that all the time. Yep. So I think he thinks of the notations as much more at the level of microcode, in my view, and more capturing the entire state of the machine, the levels of abstraction that we would use as modern programmers. Here's the hardware, here's the microcode. Well, on old machines, the microcode. Here's the external program. Here's the high level programming language that translates into it. None of that is visible to Babbage as far as I can see. And hell, why would it be? You know, I mean, if, if, if computers didn't exist, you'd have to, you'd have to, you know, who could possibly imagine all that from his perspective? Well, Adrian, it's been a fabulous evening. I mean, it's, it's been an evening full of surprises ranging from your uh, marvellous film where we'll have to give all the participants uh, your YouTube address that you sent to us okay. <laughs> so that they can watch it. Um, it's covered an enormous range of territory and it's ranged from Georgian times, as you were right to emphasize, right up to uh, 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 modern, modern hardware design and how you design com uh, complex, uh, very large scale integration chips. So it's been uh, a, a breathtaking breadth and uh, I've found it also enormously entertaining and funny. So 
Uh, people are coming up on the screen saying, excellent, many thanks, great stuff for the comments. And oh, I can only you. heartily endorse those. It's been a fabulous evening. Thank you very much indeed, Adrian. Thank you. Well, you're very kind, thank you. I was honoured to be asked. I, I hold Newcomen in very high esteem. And I've, I've, I've sat in the audience many times and been amazed at people's scholarship. So thank you for the invitation. This was a perfect Newcomen evening. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Pleasure. Adrian. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. I am waving goodbye, which is the traditional way of ending a video. That's right. We have got wavy hands, but I can't see them on the... Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot then. Bye-bye now. Bye, Adrian. Have you... Enjoy your tea. Sorry to have kept you from it for so long.